Happy New Year to all of you. Uh, let me be the first to welcome you all to the, our first What Matters to Me and Why of 2016. Uh, we're now in our fourth season, and we're very excited to have yet another exciting speaker for all of you today. Um, for those of you who are unfamiliar with What Matters to Me and Why, this is a fairly unique series. Um, it's non-academic and gives us a chance to hear more about the brilliant faculty and staff um, and more than just about their academic lives, which we don't often get to hear. Uh, we get to hear about um, their exciting stories of how they got here today, um, what makes them tick, uh, maybe some of their uh, highlights and maybe even lowlights of their career that have uh, gotten them to this place where they're um, extremely successful. And um, so yes, that's kind of what makes this series a little different than some others that you may uh, have attended at UCI. This also gives us a chance to an uh, ask questions about uh, some of the, these bright minds who we have uh, brought here for you. Um, just a few details before we get begin. First, um, you all know you have uh, your lunches. Um, and we have a few a trash cans, so we would really appreciate it if you could uh, clean up once you're done. We want to be good stewards to our hosts here in uh, the humanities um, building. So if that, that would be great if you guys could all do that. Um, also, um, most of you know, um, many, some of you may not though, the um, series is videotaped and we have a nice library of speakers on our website that you guys can all check out if you haven't seen some of them. Um, but this also means that if you're in the front row, there's a possibility you might get caught on camera. So if that's something you're not comfortable with, um, maybe in a minute you can take some time to move further towards the back. Um, also, you all should have received a questionnaire um, when you walked in, and we really appreciate it if you guys could fill this out. We really love hearing from you, uh, feedback about the speakers, about who you might like to hear from in the future. Um, some of you may have noticed that there's been a few changes in the food over the last few series, and that's in large part based on your feedback. So we would really love to hear um, all the good things and maybe things we could work on that you guys can think of. Um, and then also we have our, um, our next speaker will be um, in February. We have, um, didn't write this down. Uh, Lorraine Evangelista. And this is gonna be again on the second uh, Wednesday of the month of February. And registration for that will open three weeks in advance. So you'll wanna uh, get registered for that as soon as that's open. Um, one of the other good things about this series is that it brings together people from all areas of campus, um, including people who may not know each other particularly well, uh, faculty, staff, and students. And so what we'd like to take this time to do is to have you all maybe introduce yourself to the person you're sitting next to, um, which is a minute, and then we'll have our speaker. Okay, so now, if you'll all uh, give your attention to Jonathan Fung, who's going to be introducing our speaker for you all today. So. Well, it gives me great pleasure to be able to introduce our speaker today. Uh, the speaker is Professor Mary Gilley. She's a professor of marketing and also senior associate dean in the uh, Paul Mirage School of Business here. Her research is uh, fascinating. She focuses currently on um, consumers' interaction with and uses of technology, and also um, cross-cultural issues in consumer behavior. She received her MBA from SMU, and then a PhD from the University of Houston, and then came here in 1982 as a young assistant professor, and has spent her whole academic career here. And, uh, I guess as a result of that, she now owns 150 anteaters, <laughs> which is probably a record. <laughs> Mary is also particularly well known on campus here uh, for her work as a leader of the faculty. She has been uh, chairing many important committees in the Academic Senate, uh, including CAP, the Council on Academic Personnel, um, which um, reviews basically all of the academic personnel cases on campus, including all the promotions and tenure cases. Um, after she was chair of CAP, she was then elected to be um, in the chair line of the UCI Academic Senate. So she served eventually as chair of the UCI Academic Senate. 
And then after that, I think immediately right after that, she was elected to be chair of the system-wide academic senate. So in that role, she represented basically all of the tens of thousands of professors and um, academic staff on the 10 UC campuses. Uh, it's a very important role. She had to go up and live in Oakland for two years. I think she just returned this academic year from that. And uh, she, when she became chair, she was one of just a handful of UCI faculty who had been in that position and just one of six women to hold that position in the last 50 years. So I first met Mary a few years back uh, when we were both members of CAP. We were both actually first year members of CAP. CAP is one of the uh, more strenuous committee assignments on campus. At that time, because of confidentiality problems and things like this, it required you to basically be in this little room reviewing files about 15 hours a week and that on top of teaching and research was a pretty challenging thing for most people. Uh, I, that year, happened to also, along with my wife, have a baby that year. And so it made my life very um, full, I could say. <laughs> After Matthew was born, um, I took a one week break from CAP and then went back and it was uh, at the next CAP meeting. And when I got there, I found that Mary had actually bought gifts. Um, she brought in a book for my older son because she knew better than I did that uh, older siblings sometimes feel left out when you have a little baby in the house. And she brought two dozen Sprinkles cupcakes for the committee. If, you, if any of you ever know what a Sprinkles cupcake costs, you will know that's a very generous gift. <laughs> so we sat there as a committee eating our cupcakes. I brought about half of them home to my family. It was probably the best committee meeting I ever had. <laughs> And uh, ever since that time, I've thought if all the leaders of our great institutions in this country could be a little bit more like Mary, we'd be a lot better off. So please welcome Professor Mary Gilliam. Thank you, Tom. Thank you very much. It's really an honor to come uh, speak to this group, the What Matters to Me and Why series. You know, when you look at the um, list of presenters, uh, past and, and future, it's, a, it's quite an impressive group, and I'm not sure I fit in with it. You know, the, the word exciting was used a couple of times, I want to dampen down expe expectations. <laughs> you know, you did get a free lunch, so, you know, anything beyond that is, is gravy. Uh, and, you know, I looked at, at past speakers, um, I looked at Erwin Chermanetsky's um, uh, videotape. He was the first in his family to go to college, and we all know that he's gone on to uh, argue cases before the Supreme Court. I, I, Jim McGaugh had a great talk about the importance of free uh, higher education in California. He uh, fell into poverty when he lost his father at the age of nine. Uh, Daphne Lay, I think you're here, aren't you? Yeah. Uh, had a great story about uh, how her family lost everything when they left communist China for Taiwan. And, you know, by comparison, my story is one of, of comfort and privilege. Uh, it hasn't been all rainbows and unicorns, uh, but the, the negatives have really been kind of bumps in the road rather than trials and tribulations to overcome. I've been very fortunate. Uh, so I'm sorry if my story is boring. Uh, <laughs> you asked me to do this. <laughs> we could have done fiction, I suppose, but you know. Uh, so the, the theme to my career I would call odd man out. Now not everyone in here is English as a first language. Is everyone familiar with odd, what odd man out means? I mean, it basically means uh, that uh, it, an odd man out is someone, is a person who is left out of a group for some reason. And ironically, I've been odd man out because I'm a woman that has traditionally been in a male-dominated field. I wasn't odd man out for the first 18 years of my life. Um, in fact, I was in the majority. I'm the youngest of three sisters, no brothers. Uh, out of the nine of us cousins, there's one boy and nine girls. Uh, we did have a boy dog, um, but I was never made to feel like I was a disappointment, that uh, having a third girl was a disappointment in my family. 
Um, my father's kind of a nerdy guy. In fact, well, today is his birthday. He's 97 today, so happy birthday, Daddy. Uh, I'm going back to Dallas to celebrate this weekend. Um, he really wasn't into sports, so he wasn't, you know, wanting to, to throw a ball with anybody or anything like that. In fact, my mom is, is more of a sports fanatic than he is. He, you know, even today we get into fights about the Angels versus the Rangers and things like that. Uh, and in fact, she played basketball in high school, uh, so she was much more the athlete. I have a Facebook friend who has three young daughters, and he's always kind of railing about the questions he gets, like, don't you wish you had a son and all this. So I actually asked my dad uh, a few months ago, did you get questions like this when, you know, about the fact that you had three daughters? And he said no. He didn't remember anyone asking him about that, which is interesting, you know, today versus, you know, how many years ago that I won't say. Um, but I do have to tell a story on my mother. Uh, my, uh, about a year ago, my nephew called his grandmother, my mother, to tell her about uh, the, the results, um, news on his wife's third pregnancy. They have two daughters and they found out that the third was going to be a girl. And my mother's response was, oh, no. And I happen to be there, and I'm just, <laughs> how am I not supposed to be offended by this? And her response was, well, I didn't mean you. <laughs> so I don't know what that means. So I grew up in Dallas, Texas. Um, I, I, people always ask me why I don't have a Texas accent. And uh, I have lived in California for 33 years. But even when I lived in Texas and I would go to conferences and so forth, people would ask why I don't have a Texas accent. So this is a Texas accent when, <laughs> when you're in Dallas, I guess. Um, my dad is an attorney and a CPA. Uh, he um, uh, is a very smart guy. Uh, he. Uh, passed his CPA exam the first time, which I understand is quite unusual. My mom didn't go to college. She went to secretarial school and worked for a while before um, they got married, and then she became a stay-at-home mom. Uh, but she always did volunteer work. She worked at uh, the Children's Hospital in Dallas, and uh, she also worked at our church uh, doing volunteer work. So my dad worked at a variety of small oil companies. Uh, until about, um, he started a law and accounting practice when I was about 12 years old. And any of you who have any relatives that start their own businesses, you know it's very demanding and very time consuming. Uh, but my dad was home for dinner every night with us, every single night. He had a study and he would sometimes go and work while we were watching TV or doing homework or whatever. Uh, and on weekends he would often be working, but he was always home for dinner. Uh, and every summer, we would go somewhere for two-week vacation. He'd throw us all in the car, and, and we'd go somewhere. So, uh, you know, my sisters and I would, you know, debate over, you know, here's the line, you cross the line in the back seat, and, you know, we'd fight. And I was probably the most obnoxious one, so I ended up getting to sit in front with my mom and, and dad, so they didn't fight as much in the back seat. Uh, even my my grandparents lived very close by, and we would see them probably once a week as well. So we had, I didn't, my cousins didn't live in the area, but I did have grandparents close by. Uh, so it was a, a great childhood. Um, in first grade, I was put into an advanced class, and this really meant that I was with the same 30 kids throughout my entire elementary school career. You know, one or two would move here or there, but basically it was the same 30 kids. I lived in the same house from kindergarten through high school. Very stable childhood. Uh, I went to a very large high school. It was about 2,200 students. It was three grades, not four. And uh, I was not the most popular, but popular enough. As an aside, when my kids were in uh, middle school, I read a book that was recommended on parenting teenagers called Get Out of My Life, But First Can You Take Cheryl and Me to the Mall. <laughs> I actually recommended a lot. And I thought it was something that resonated with me. They said that the popular kids 
you know, that position is a very precarious one, and so it causes a lot of stress. And if you're an unpopular kid, you're, you could be the subject of bullying, which is, is bad too. So you really want, the ideal position is kind of the second tier of popularity, which is kind of where I think I was. I, I was just kind of, you know, the popular kids didn't harass me and the unpopular kids didn't, you know, it was fine. Um, I, I feel like I could have been a good athlete, but this was Texas in, in the 60s. And I, I, I once looked back at my uh, yearbook and I saw that uh, this, all the sports for girls were uh, tennis and swimming. That was it. So what I did was drill team. You want to know what drill team is? Okay, we didn't have guns or anything like that. <laughs> if you're thinking military drill team, it's not, it wasn't like that. We, it was more like the Rockettes. So we would be out on the football field with the marching band during uh, halftime and do our halftime show and everything. So um, uh, boys, on the other hand, had football. Obviously, it was Texas. My gosh, you know, Friday Night Lights all over again. Uh, basketball, baseball, uh, track and field, golf, uh, tennis, swimming, goes on and on. This was obviously pre-Title IX. And I, I kind of got to live out some of my could have been a contender fantasies uh, with my daughter who, you know, I got to be a soccer mom and a tennis mom with her, but I never got to play soccer or, well, I played tennis, but I wasn't very good at it. So, um, and my dad wasn't real athletic. My mom was, but, you know, it, she just didn't encourage us that way. Uh, I was a good student, but I wasn't as good as my best friend was. My best friend was valedictorian of our class. She ended up graduating from UT Austin in three years. She is now uh, a federal judge, and she was the first woman appointed federal in the uh, East Texas district, federal district judge. Uh, I think it's kind of cool that she and I both grew up to be in professions where we wear robes, you know. <laughs> I don't wear mine every day like she does, but you know, in fact, I was back, she, they had an unveiling of her portrait and I was back there in June, and I was in Oakland and on my way back to Irvine for graduation, so I had my robe with me, so we took pictures of the, <laughs> the two of us in our robes. It was kind of cool. Uh, so I went to Trinity University. Uh, somebody here is a fellow alum, so she knows that. Uh, and it's uh, in San Antonio, a small liberal arts college. And I didn't start out there as odd man out. Uh, it was really my decision to be an economics major that was the start of it. Uh, I only had male professors and mostly male students in the class. Uh, as a part of my program, I had to take business statistics, and the guy that taught that was a marketing professor, and I loved it. I thought it was, I had taken math statistics and found it really boring. I made an A because I would fill out the formulas right and everything. But business statistics, it was suddenly why I was doing it made perfect sense. And he was using these examples that I found fascinating about, I remember one that, you know, canned salmon used to be much more popular than canned tuna. And the way they promoted it, promoted tuna was it's not pink. <laughs> Like that's an important attribute, but it worked, you know. So I thought this was really cool. Um, so I wanted to take an, another class with this professor, uh, Richard Burr, and but he only taught marketing research, which is an elective, and you have to take basic marketing in order to take marketing research. So I took basic marketing from a professor that was so boring. He was it was so bad. And I wonder what would have happened if that had been my only marketing class. Uh, I don't know what I would, you know, I can't believe that I would have taken more marketing after that class because it was a real snooze. Uh, even though marketing itself is really exciting. <laughs> uh, so it was kind of too late in, in my college career to, to change, th change majors or anything. I was an economics major. So I decided to get an MBA. And I went to SMU, and I was one of uh, six women out of 70 in the class. 
And I actually looked it up this morning, and that was the national average was about 10 percent in 1975 uh, of women in MBA programs. And one of the cool things that happened to me at SMU is they don't have a doctoral program, but they have faculty that engage in research. And so MBA students act as research assistants. So I was assigned to be a research assistant to two marketing faculty members that were working on a project, and I loved it. I thought this was the coolest thing. And so I decided, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to work for a marketing research firm. Well, 1975 was a recession. And uh, one thing that's it's really easy for firms to cut back on is marketing research. They shouldn't, <laughs> but they do. And so uh, my professor that it, I was serving as RA for uh, said to me, well, why don't you think about getting into a PhD program? And if you're a professor, you can do the kind of research you want to do instead of what your boss tells you to do. And I thought that was interesting. And then he added, which I also thought was interesting, because I was single at the time, and he was married, he still is married, to a stay-at-home mom. He said, I think it's a good, academia is a good career for women, because it offers a lot of flexibility. And I, I thought that was great. And one thing it really tells me, and one thing I try to do, is people don't think about becoming an academic unless somebody puts it in their head. And that's one of the, you know, the nice things about uh, smaller classes and getting to know your professors is that you know, they can say, have you thought about this? And put the, put the idea in your head. Uh, so I took Tom's advice, and I applied to doctoral programs. And this is where a bump in the road came. Uh, I had started dating a guy our freshman year at Trinity, the first week of freshman year. And we'd had our ups and downs, and uh, he had located to Houston for a job after graduation. So I ended up going to University of Houston. Not the most prestigious university I got into or uh, applied to. And, uh, but fortunately for me, they had some really good marketing scholars there. Uh, I got married on the sixth year anniversary of meeting him, and the marriage lasted six, less than six months. Go figure. I wish he'd figured out he didn't want to be married before we actually got married, but you know, it's water under the bridge. Uh, but I'd already made the decision to go to University of Houston. Again, odd man out. Uh, there were, I was the only uh, woman in the doctoral program in marketing. There may have been a few more in the business school. There was a big a uh, room about this size that had desks in it for doctoral students, you know, their, our office. And that was always called the bullpen until I got there. And then they decided, well, they couldn't call it the bullpen anymore. So I think it became the, the playpen. So. Uh, so I was assigned to be a, a research assistant for a professor. And he was an interesting guy. He was divorced. He wore these, you know, shiny polyester shirts, you know, kind of open to here with the gold chains and everything. I mean, it was the 70s, you know, it, it, it wasn't that freaky, but it was a little, you know. And, but what's interesting, I learned a couple of years later that uh, from other doctoral students that everyone assumed I was sleeping with him. He had never treated me anything other than extremely professionally and supportive, and I just thought that was really sad that you couldn't have that kind of relationship without rumors going on. Um, when it came time to find a dissertation chair, I was told by the department chair that all the male faculty members had way too many students. And so I should consider Betsy Gelb. Now Betsy had gotten her degree, her PhD, in uh, management with a minor in marketing at University of Houston because she was geographically constrained because her husband had a company in Houston. And she had been hired at an administrative job, but her academic home was in marketing. And she was an assistant professor. So this sounds like a disaster, right? You know, it, it was great. She was a fabulous advisor. I couldn't have asked for someone better than her. It really worked out well. And in fact, she's had a fabulous career since. She's a chaired professor there, still in Houston, because her husband has, has a 
company in Houston, uh, and she's mentored many other uh, doctoral students along the way. So lucky me, I, I fell into what could have been a disaster. I, Jonathan has missed a couple of things on my CV, I, or maybe I dropped them off at one point, but I actually had a couple of faculty positions before I came here. I was very young when I came here, but I did have a couple of positions. The first one was at Texas A&M. Again, I was odd man out, first woman to be on the faculty. Um, when I came, they had hired a new dean who was also in marketing, so the marketing department decided to have a reception for the whole business school to introduce them to the, to the new dean. And so I get a call from the department chair's wife asking me to serve punch with the other faculty wives. I want to be a team player, you know, but I didn't want to be mistaken for a faculty wife when I was meeting my colleagues in other departments for the first time. So I hemmed and hawed and ultimately I agreed to do it and then I thought about it and I just, I just can't do this. So I went to my department chair and I said, you know, I, I agreed to do this but, you know, I'll wash dishes, I'll, you know, clean up, I'll do whatever, you, you know, the men were uh, serving wine, I can do that. Uh, and so he goes, I understand, you know, I'll take care of it. So I thought his wife would, I didn't want her to feel bad that she hadn't thought about this. But she called me up and ripped me up one side and down the other about how I had no faculty wife to contribute and to the punch serving team and all this. And, uh, but I didn't serve punch, which was a good thing. Uh, Valerie Zeithamel joined about six months later, which was great. But it was difficult being single in a small college town, not just because there weren't men to date, but there weren't girlfriends to go get pizza and a movie with either. So uh, I had a dog, a uh, male dog, <laughs> and, uh, but I sp spent a lot of time. In fact, when I first moved to, to A&M, it was in the summer, I was teaching a summer school class. In the first six weeks I was there, I had breakfast, lunch, and dinner alone, well, with my do dog for six weeks. It was really, it was just lonely. It was not set up to, to be good for me. So I ended up taking a job at SMU. Uh, once again, odd man out, six faculty, 60 faculty, six women, 60 faculty, uh, only one in marketing. Uh, I remember going out to lunch with the other five women in marketing one time, I mean in, in the business school one time, and we were coming back from the parking lot, and more than one, uh, comment from a faculty member, a male faculty member was, oh, are you out, you know, are you plotting to take over the school? Is it, you know, is this a coup you're staging? And, you know, I had to laugh because, you know, you see six male faculty members going to lunch all the time together and nobody said, oh, are you taking over the school? Because they basically had the school. So <laughs> I guess that was it. Um, I, it was a very social department and they go to lunch together and so I asked the department chair, I'll teach anytime, eight in the morning, eight at night, please don't give me lunch uh, time classes. The whole time I was there, I taught noon to one. <laughs> Fortunately, I, there were a couple of faculty members that, that automatically thought to include me. I, it wasn't that they were, oh, poor Mary, I've got to include it. No, it was just an automatic thing. So for happy hours, I'd get invited to happy hours because the department chair didn't go to those. Uh, so uh, that was an interesting experience. So um, I'm trying to keep ta track of the time so I don't make you late for class or work. I, I did have an experience with a student at SMU, which was kind of unfortunate, but I think it was because I was young and I was female. Uh, I was teaching a class and I handed back their papers and it was a case write-up and I said, um, you know, if you feel like the grade is unfair, I'd like you to write out why you think it is, what I missed, why my comment is off, and, and I'd be happy to reread it. So one of the male students comes up and he says, this is an A paper, it had a C on it. And I said, well, do it, you know, as I told the class, write it up. So he writes on, this is an A paper and hands it to me. So I didn't want to fight about it. So, you know, I reread it. I gave a lot more detailed comments and everything. 
And in my office was a, a former classroom that had been divvied up with just dividers uh, to make with four other, uh, to make four faculty offices. And there were three men and the other three. And um, you could hear someone drop a paper clip. You know, it was really not very private at all. And the student came in and, you know, he'd gotten my additional comments and he, he was, started yelling at me. You know, this is an A paper. And I'd say, well, an A paper would have this. And well, I thought about that. Okay, I am not a mind reader, you know, if it's not in the paper, it doesn't count. Uh, and he kept going on and I finally said, listen, you know, we, we just disagree, but I'm the decision maker here, so I think this conversation is over. And he said, no, you're not the decision maker. I'm going to take it to the department chair. So he did, and fortunately, the department chair backed me up on it. But uh, after the student finally, <coughs> finally left, the other three male faculty members in our little former classroom came in and said, no student would ever talk to us like that. They were just shocked that a student would, would do that. So it's, it's not just odd man out on the faculty, it was you know, for students too. Um, while I was at SMU, I got engaged to John Graham, who was a marketing faculty member at USC. And he and I met at a marketing educators conference uh, four years earlier. And we would see each other at the conference once a year for like three years. And then we started a long distance relationship and uh, decided to, to get married. Um, it was, I went back and calculated the number of days we were in the same city at the same time before we got engaged. And it was 33 days. <laughs> So I kind of go, what was I thinking? Oh my gosh, you know, he, he had two kids, you know, it was, it was crazy, but it's worked out. We're still married 33 years later, uh, compared to six year relationship, six month marriage, you know, <laughs> go figure. Uh, and so we wanted to, we wanted to uh, live in the same city. And I was in Dallas, he was in uh, Los Angeles. And at the time, you're not going to believe this, you're going to think I've gone into my fiction mode, but at the time there were about three jobs for every one candidate in my field. It's not that good anymore, but it's better than in a lot of other fields. But uh, everyone was always looking. All the departments were always looking because there was a shortage of people. So we figured, well, I'll interview at USC, John will interview at SMU, we'll see you know, what's the best option. And the department at, at USC was very interested in, in talking with me, but the dean said, I don't want any married couples on the faculty. He already had two on the faculty, but they had gotten married after they got there. So in retrospect, maybe we should have, shouldn't have said anything. Uh, and the guys at SMU you know, took him out to lunch, but said, no, we don't, you know, we don't want a married couple on the faculty. That'll be awkward. You'll be a voting block. Uh, you know, it will, you'll have sex on the copy machine. I don't, <laughs> I don't know what they thought was going to happen, but you know, it, it, it was not good. So, um, so, uh, so USC and SMU were not an option. And I, I had a friend at, on the faculty at UCLA and he said, there's this school down at, in Irvine, UC Irvine, and they're recruiting. And uh, so I went down. There were 19 people on the faculty, and I uh, interviewed, and I was offered a position. Uh, the marketing group was 50% women. Well, that's because I was one, and there was one <laughs> man. But, you know, still, it was an improvement. Uh, but in addition, uh, Joan Pierce and Judy Rosner were already here, and Robin Keller came with me at the time. So out of 19 faculty, to have four women was kind of amazing. And you're not sitting, you know, in the, you're not the only one in the room anymore. So uh, Joan Pierce paved the way for establishing what the parameters of childbearing leave would be. So I just kind of slipstreamed behind her. I didn't have to fight that battle. It had already been, been won. Um, John ended up joining the faculty after some bias against married couples here. Um, and now I think it's great that we have a career partners program where we actually see it as a recruiting tool 
In fact, in the uh, Mirage School of Business, we, we just hired a couple this fall that are starting next summer, so it's exciting. I was told to include career setbacks as well as triumphs, and I've had those. Um, I went up for tenure about the, I think my, sec my daughter, my second child was born, um, and I went up for tenure, and I got a tentative de denial. And kind of the word on the street or in the halls was, you know, I was nice. And apparently being nice and being a scholar are, you know, you can't be both. So, um, and about that time, the Faculty Women's Association was formed. And I, I don't know if it's active anymore. We used to have a reception every year for the new women faculty. But it was a lifesaver for me. Uh, talking to women across campus and, and finding out it wasn't just me and uh, getting great feedback for how I should handle things. And uh, Judy Rosner was really helpful. Uh, Barbara Burgess, I don't know if some people remember Barbara. She was, you know, just inspirational. She just, she wouldn't get to put up with anything that uh, she shouldn't put up with. So it was good to have people like them on my side. And uh, I'd get, a, you know, you'd get advice like, if you have to leave a meeting to go pick up your child, don't say, I have to leave to pick up my child. You say, I have to pick up my car. Apparently, that's more acceptable. I think things have changed. I'm hoping things have changed. Uh, so ultimately, I was told to wait a year. And I did go up for tenure a year later. And obviously, I was successful. Or I wouldn't be here. Um, and I've received uh, every merit and promotion uh, on time ever since, uh, even if not unanimously supported by my colleagues. In fact, it's rarely been unanimous. So that's kind of been why I pursued opportunities outside of, of the business school. Um, I was the Associate Dean of uh, Graduate Studies for four years. And as um, Jonathan pointed out, I was on a number of um, academic senate committee committees. So um, at UCOP the last two years, um, you know, all this was kind of a long time ago, you know, you still have feelings of odd man out. I, I chaired a committee that oversaw the national labs and there weren't any other women on that, but you know, it's, it's better. Uh, I, as Jonathan pointed out, I was the sixth woman of 50 chairs of the system-wide senate. And, uh, but having Janet Napolitano as chair, as president, and Amy Dorr as provost, you know, having very visible women in senior leadership positions made me feel a lot less odd than I'd ever felt before. And I was really blessed by a real sorority of the five women who preceded me as chair. Uh, provost Dorr had been in my position about 10 years earlier. Mary Krogan, the executive director for research and graduate studies at the Office of the President were there always there to, to help and support, and uh, it, it was really, really great. Um, now, the Paul Mirage School of Business has the greatest, the largest percentage of women faculty of any business school in the world, close to 50%. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's kind of amazing. And, uh, Doug was asking me about this beforehand, you know, was this a, you know, a strategy? I don't think it was a strategy. It just kind of happened. And I think the fact that it, we don't have departments means that, that the, the women who are in the, on the faculty are less isolated. So if you're the only accounting women, at least you've got someone in marketing and that kind of thing. Uh, so, but I think these experiences of being odd man out made me more sensitive to making others feel included. Uh, the uh, career achievement I'm most uh, proud of is the Williams Qual Spratlin Multicultural Mentoring Award of Excellence. And um, I've mentored a number of underrepresented minority doctoral students. They formed their own little support network called the Gilly Girls, mm -hmm. girls with a Z, so it's cool that way. Uh, <laughs> Betsy Gelb is now our gra their, their grand advisor and it gets included in all their events. Um, but I think the more diverse we become, the less any one individual will feel like they don't belong in the group, whether it's gender or ethnicity or socioeconomic background, religion, or any other characteristic that makes us feel different, we should still be made to feel like we belong. 
And I'm grateful to all the women and men who have made the effort to make me feel less like the odd man out. Thank you. Thank you, Mary, for, for a great talk. Now we have some time for questions and answer questions. So there'll be a mic over there and one here. Please raise your hand and wait till the mic comes. We want to get your question on the video. I'll start it off, Mary. Okay. <laughs> Since I'm uh, associated with the Interfaith Center, I always like to know a little bit about our speakers' uh, faith experience. Did you have any faith experience? Um, I was raised Presbyterian. I'm still a member of the Presbyterian Church and uh, was in church choir and Sunday school and the whole shebang all through, and that's been very influential in my life. What area of marketing you're most interested in, and has that changed in recent years with the advent of the internet and online commerce? Certainly, yeah. Um, my field has always been consumer behavior. My dissertation was on uh, consumer complaints uh, and how companies respond to them. Uh, one of the things that's great about being an academic you know, and, and that's what uh, Tom Berry at SMU pointed out to me, is you can do the kind of research you want to do. And so I can do research that's not about how do I sell, how does a company sell more things to consumers. Uh, although you can do that. Uh, but right now I'm, I'm looking at uh, consumers in debt and how they deal with temptation when uh, they're trying to pay off their debts and not spend new money. Uh, so that's less technology oriented than some of my past research that was on online shopping. I looked very early on at uh, online shopping and did some focus groups in Irvine and, and it was interesting this one, uh, the, this firm located people and you want 8 to 12 people in a focus group and uh, so you look at a list and you say well these are the people I don't want if you have too many people. And one of them was an 80-year-old woman, and uh, so we said, but fortunately, we didn't have enough people. And she did all her shopping online. She said, you know, these handsome young men bring me my groceries. It's great. It's and she made the observation, I think I've been able to stay independent longer because of the Internet. And so that inspired me to do some uh, looking at how technology affects seniors in, in terms of shopping and using the internet to stay in touch and that kind of thing, and looked at, at issues related to that. So yeah, and, and sometimes I say I wish I taught 18th century English poetry because you know, then I could use the same notes you know, class to class, but maybe not. I, if there are any 18th century English poets out there, um, but marketing is changing so much with social media and uh, the millennials are less interested in things, they're more interested in experiences. There's, it's a very exciting field. Shirley? Hi, I have two questions, um, two very different questions. You talked about your, your transition from Texas to California and you touched a little bit on the accent and how people said you didn't have one. I wanted to know if you, if there was a, did you feel a cultural shift when you left, because Texas is a lot different than here. And my other question was in relation to your research. You talked about um, studying consumer and their debt, and I wondered um, if you were doing any predictive research for future recessions or how things might be evolving for you in that area. Okay. I, yes, I did find differences. Of course, I've been in California for over 30 years now, so I've gotten used to it. But uh, there are some, you know, for example, in, in Texas, if you're standing in line in a department store to pay or a grocery, you start chatting. You, you know, and so I came here and I'd start talking to the person next to me in the line at the bank and they're like, you know, <laughs> what? 
you know, and now I go back to Texas and it's like, oh, yes, I'm supposed to talk to you. So, <laughs> you know, and, and at least at, at that time, the drivers were a lot more courteous. You would wave and, and, you know, let people pass and that kind of thing. So I did see some differences in that respect. Um, as far as my research, predictive research, I, right now we're trying to understand uh, what types of things are there are there tricks and training that can happen in a, for people in a debt management program to help them succeed uh, there, it's very much a financial literacy kind of model that if people only knew about compound interest they would pay off their debts and we're finding that's not the case they're 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 they have this debt and they know they're not supposed to spend money but you know, their daughter had a bad day at school and they feel like they need to treat them, you know. So uh, we're finding ways to kind of engage them in mindful behavior in terms of framing it as uh, being a hero and changing your life as opposed to struggling with this. So that's what I'm working on. Do you have any advice for graduate students who are pursuing an academic position these days? I do it in marketing. <laughs> in the 70s. I, I, so you're already in the program. I, it's really important to network and go to a conference, even if they're local conferences, and see what the lay of the land is uh, before you go out on the market. Because it can be, if the first conference you go to is the one where you're interviewing for positions, it's really stressful and uh, you know and, and unknown. So I would say, you know, definitely check out conferences before you're on the market. And you know, be as flexible and open as you can in terms of geography and, and that kind of thing. I can ask you, Jim, did you have trouble <laughs> transitioning from Texas to <laughs> California? Uh, yeah, I, I did that as a graduate student. Mm -hmm. And uh, I went to Rice. I didn't know you knew that. Right? I, I did, it. yeah. I didn't take a statistics course at the ah. uh, so. But um, yeah, I did notice a difference. Uh, that's the same difference you, you had. Although at, at, my, at that age, it was a little different for me. And, and, and I went to Stanford. And Stanford was kind of this amazing place. Even that um, But uh, you didn't say a whole lot about you know, being chair of the faculty for the whole system. Yeah. And I was just wondering, how do you feel now that you've done that about the direction of the university as a whole? Um, well, that's, you know, do we have another uh, <laughs> hour or so? It was a really interesting experience. And you really get immersed in things all you see and all higher education while you're there. Uh, every morning I would get a clip service where it would, any article on higher education or UC or Janet giving a speech, you read it and you'd be totally immersed in it. And I, it was actually kind of surprising when I came back here and I would talk to some of my colleagues who were going, yeah, wasn't there something about a tuition increase proposed? And I'm just, what? You know, <laughs> um, the lack of respect on the governor's part, the governor's staff part, and the legislator's part for UC and what we are is frightening. But it's a nationwide problem. Uh, now most uh, California legislators have Cal State degrees, not UC degrees. It didn't used to be that way. The legislators really don't see the difference between the two systems. Uh, there were a lot of concerns on the part of the Academic Senate when, when Janet Napolitano was named president because she's the first non-academic. But it really is a kind of a half academic, half political job and any academic that would come into that role wouldn't know the political part of it. Um, and I think she's an amazingly fast learner. 
she says the right thing, she values research, she you know, carries the message extremely well. But this is a very recalcitrant governor. He wasn't a friend of the UC in the 70s. He's not a friend of the UCs now. Uh, we gotta wait him out. Um, we're, we're not getting the resources we need to continue to serve the people of the state of California. And it really troubles me that back when uh, UC classrooms were filled with uh, predominantly white uh, middle class and upper middle class students uh, that we offered it for free and now that we've got a much more uh, heterogeneous student population some you know a lot more first in family to go to college a lot more from backgrounds that, that don't have a lot of experience with higher education and need support we're cutting back and charging tuition it just it just doesn't seem right to me I'm curious uh, about the changes that you've um, noted in your students over the years, and particularly maybe over the last 10 years. Well, I teach MBA students, so I, have, I did have one freshman seminar, but I've only taught MBAs since I've been here. I, and I'll, I guess I really enjoy teaching the, the FEMBAs, the fully employed MBAs, because uh, they're working and they can bring their problems that they have at work into the classroom in an interesting way. Um, do I see a difference? There's a, lot, the, there's a lot more stress that, you know, they're getting up early and, and coming to class at 7 o'clock at night, and uh, they have families, they're more likely to have families now. Uh, it, so it's, it's difficult to get them uh, to, to read as much as previous generations did. Uh, I'm, I'm having to be careful with the assignments um, and coordinate more. But, yeah, I mean, even at the MBA level, there's a difference in students. There's just a higher stress level with their commitments and obligations in addition to school. All right, so is there one last question? Talk. I want to just remind you that, um, as Rebecca mentioned, the next talk is February 10th. It's Lorraine Evangelista, professor in the program of nursing science. So please be on the lookout for that. Let's thank Mary for a wonderful.